panel. Here's the panel, everybody. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Bradley Kuhn, and we have really a wonderful opportunity that really only occurs with live events like this. As most of you in the room probably know, although for those of you who don't, we're gonna summarize the situation briefly to start. There has uh, been quite a lot of news about a particular topic the last two weeks. We were able uh, to agilely put together this panel of folks who are all experts and involved in the situation to talk to you today. So I'm going to briefly summarize, uh, and then I'm going to pass it to each uh, person for a 90-second uh, uh, thing, which I'm also going to start and hold myself to the same 90 seconds. So what has happened is for the last 20 years, a company named Red Hat, known by IBM, has had a business model. Uh, that has involved subscription services to a Linux-based operating system. Historically, the source code for this uh, was fully made public in various different ways over various different periods of time. And a couple of weeks ago, Red Hat made an announcement that they were going to keep the source code public but basically hidden in plain sight, that you have to dig through a giant pile of source code that may or may not be relevant to find the source code you need. Of course, their customers who are subscribers to their service will receive the rights under the GPL, and we'll be talking more about that shortly. As most of you probably know, I'm an expert in GPL and copyleft license compliance. Uh, I have, for the last 20 years, literally 20 years, been studying this business model. I do not know to this day whether or not it complies with the GPL or not. It is an open question. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to each of our panelists to introduce themselves, and they'll explain a little bit how they're involved in the situation. So I'll turn it over to you, Benny. Hi, I'm Benny. I... <laughs> Great, the husband's here, he's definitely gonna heckle. <laughs> so I, uh, I chair a operating system called Alma Linux. We are one of the ones that popped up after the uh, CentOS stream shift. We are, you know, the same thing that we're all gonna hear today. We're community led, we're community driven. Our users are everyone from, you know, massive science projects to huge uh, uh, corporations and everything in between, the, the, home, the home lab folks everything. So I'm super excited to be here. I think that this is probably going to be the most interesting panel I've ever been on. So go ahead. Jeremy, please. Hi, I'm Jeremy Allison. Uh, I work for CIQ, who offer uh, commercial support for Rocky Linux. And Rocky is another one of the um, rebuilds that uh, happened after CentOS stream was, uh, CentOS was discontinued. Um, so, you know, we provide support for Rocky. Um, CIQ doesn't own the Rocky Linux project. Um, it's a community-led uh, under a... Uh, I don't know what, what the... Uh, I don't think it's a 501c3. It's, it's some organization. It's the Rocky Linux Enterprise. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a non-profit, basically. Um, the, on, the only thing I want to mention is that um, I have a lot of friends at Red Hat. Uh, I work with Red Hat engineers every day. Um, my main project is Samba that I work on. Uh, I work upstream on that. I work with Red Hat engineers who contribute, who do fantastic work. Um, I've worked with many of the Red Hat engineers. Um, I think they're great people. They're all in incredibly um, moral. They want to do the right thing. So I really don't want this to be a sort of let's shout at Red Hat panel, because I, I don't think the engineers deserve that. Not so sure about management, but, um, <laughs> but, but management's always different. I'm an engineer, you can tell. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's my uh, take on the situation. I wrote a piece uh, that was published on the CIQ blog where I equated uh, what Red Hat was doing with what happened to the Unix, um, uh, the proprietary Unixes back in the 90s. Um, you can read it, it's uh, available. Um, and with that, I think I'll pass over to Jim, please. Hi, everyone. Um, 
my name is Jim Wright. I'm uh, Oracle's chief architect for open source, and uh, I'm both uh, an engineer and also an attorney. Um, but I will uh, consequently keep my keep my comments uh, so possibly somewhat reserved. Um, I, I'm here because Oracle Linux is uh, is another distribution that has been compatible with Red Hat uh, for a long time, and we have some. Uh, some opinions to express regarding this change, uh, and I, I guess I'm happy to sh happy to share them with the world. I also um, I tried to post some backup material on the Oracle Linux blog this morning, but you know when trying to get blog posts through a corporate machine, they may or may they may or may not have shown up already or later in the day or whatever. So uh, obviously there's at least two entities that should be here that aren't that I want to mention. We did invite Sousa. Uh, they, uh, they were grateful for the invitation, but were unable to send someone uh, for this panel. We also invited another company uh, that's owned by IBM called Red Hat that you may have heard of. Uh, we sent them an email two weeks ago to all of the key people. They, as far as I think, as of this morning, still have not answered that email. About a week ago, we inquired through back channels and confirmed the email was received, uh, and we encouraged a response to come to that email, and no response has come. So Red Hat, I guess, has said no comment to all of you and us. Um, but that being said, my first couple of questions will be softballs for, for Red Hat's sake, and we'll see where they go. So the first question I want to ask the panel is, Red Hat's argument is uh, we pay people to work on open source and free software, if you would like to be a rebuilder, just buy our product and pay us. Why do all of your entities not just want to pay Red Hat to do this and get what you need? You want me to go first? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the way that you phrased it, I want to make sure that we're clear. The way that they have asked us to work with them is specifically not to do that, right? to not go get the go sign up for an account and use that code and repackage it and ship it. Uh, if from my perspective, you, you, the question you asked was, why don't you just want to pay Red Hat? Real talk, I do like I, I do pay Red Hat for some of the things that, that we need, but not, not through Alma, but as a user, right? But there's still a very strong need as is evidenced by the fact that we're all here, right, for a non-Red Hat uh, enterprise Linux. So that's, that's why I don't. OK, so um, Red Hat's agreements make it very difficult to do that, um, because essentially what they're asking you to do is to forego some of the rights that you're granted under the GPL. I, I, that's the way I feel about it. Um, I, I, they're not demanding that. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I defer to those who are. So I don't know whether this is GPL compliant or not. But there are, what they're asking you to do is to forego some of the freedoms that you as a user should have. And I don't think that's a reasonable ask, unfortunately. Now, having said that, I want to praise Red Hat very much for creating uh, what is considered the enterprise Linux standard. And the reason that people want um, Alma and Rocky and Oracle is because Red Hat have such a strong brand, they've created a demand around that, and they have to get a lot of credit for that. But their philosophy is sort of one size fits all, come to Red Hat to get everything. And that's, that's just not what the customers want. Um, they want a range of options, they want a range of, of purchasing enterprise Linux, and I think there's more room for flexibility around that than simply that, well, if everyone just bought it from Red Hat, then the problem would go away. Uh, I, I think customers demand, customers demand freedom. That, that's the whole point of free software and open source. They want to be in charge of their own destinies, and they don't want to have to go to one single source to get uh, a, a, a product. I mean, if you wanted that, just buy Windows, right? You know, that's <laughs> it's always the same. It's always supported. Um, so I'll, I'll answer first crassly in the Oracle way, because I don't want to give you money, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but 
you know, sort, sort of beyond that, I feel like this is intrinsically um, and irreconcilably in conflict with the community norms with, in, you know, in, in which we are all stakeholders. The free software foundation's free software definition requires that the software be freely redistributable. The OSI's open source definition requires that the software be freely redistributable and that the source be published. The, in Red Hat's own words, actually, um, I'm, I'm gonna get out a note here because I, I wanna make sure I get the words of what they have said exactly right. <laughs> If they had sent us a statement, I would have read it on their behalf, but they didn't answer it. So you're going to read their statement on their behalf. I'm going to so read. I'm Go reading from from a from a page with, on on RedHot.com called "What is Open Source." The second sentence of the very first paragraph says, "Open source software is code that is designed to be publicly accessible. Anyone." can see, modify, and distribute the code as they see fit. This is Red Hat's definition of open source. When you close up the availability of that source, is that designed to be publicly accessible? When you provide it only under the terms of a contract, which clearly provides that you cannot redistribute the code, can anyone see, modify, and distribute the code as they see fit? No. It, the, 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 the conclusion is sort of unavoidable that like what they're doing is not, it's not consistent with anybody's idea of what open source is, even their own, right, it, it, and, until now. So I, I guess I feel like, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a really good point, Jim, that you're raising. I, I, I think that that's kind of the reason why we who focus on compliance with GPL have spent so many years wondering if it complies with the GPL. I've often called the business model, if you exercise your rights under GPL, your money is no good here. The argument the Red Hat makes for their GPL compliance is all we're doing is saying we don't want a business relationship with people who exercise their rights under GPL. And it's hard to find in the GPL any section that says you have to maintain a business relationship with somebody. Uh, but what I think the interesting thing is what I want to ask the panel on my next question here is what do we do about the intimidation part of it? The agreements that Red Hat puts forward have the right to audit every single customer at any time. If you're a customer of Red Hat, they can come into your enterprise, you agree to this, if you want their services, and they can look at every server and see whether or not you're running a copy of RHEL that has a subscription. And if you are running copies of RHEL that don't have a subscription, you have a choice to start paying them more money or not be their customer anymore. And a lot of people are in fear about this. So how, how, do, how do we deal with this as a community that wants to rebuild this stuff if the folks who have the source code are afraid to give it to us because they might lose their business relationship. I mean, it's not, I, I'd go even further. Um, so in, in I, I, again, I don't know if the stuff made it onto my blog yet, but what their agreement says, and, and, and to be clear, I'm not gonna come up here and accuse Red Hat of breaching an agreement, you know, violating the GPL, anything else, right? But what their agreement says is, it's a material breach if you distribute this code. It doesn't just say we can terminate the business relationship. By saying it's a material breach, there are other implications like potential damages and other things, right? And I'm not gonna make, I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna accuse them of anything, but I think, you know, it, it's kind of funny that they say that like people who are rebuilding don't add value when I have, you know, Oracle has, many years of kernel contributions <laughs> that, that they're including in RHEL and MySQL and Java. But, the, but besides that, I, I think that, to, you know, you really, you know, there are other copyright holders, not, not us, because I think, frankly, just mm -hmm. this crowd doesn't, wouldn't like us to be an enforcer, even if, even if we thought that was the right thing to do. Um, but there are other copyright holders maybe sitting on this stage and or maybe watching out here that 
might have an opinion about this. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Jeremy. I, my, my big question to you is: is what, what do we? I, get, if you can get to this, what do we do about getting the source code if people are afraid to give us a source code? That's that's a big question. That's a practical question we have. So I am I am both upstream and downstream from Red Hat. I am a copyright holder of stuff that goes into Red Hat that they redistribute as part of my Samba code. Um, so so I'm you know plain devil's advocate. Red Hat's argument is: well, all the source code is out there. It's just in the stream repository or whatever. Uh, this doesn't really fly simply because, and, and I don't know who put this, I, it, it might have been a blog post from Oracle or was, someone else put it in a wonderful way. They said, uh, and I'm going to equate it to Samba, I'm going to rephrase it for Samba, I'm going to say, look, when we give you Samba 4.18, which is our latest release, we don't tell you, oh yeah, the code for Samba 4.15 is in there somewhere, you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> which essentially is what Red Hat is doing. They're saying, oh yeah, all the code that goes into RHEL is upstream in, in stream, uh, CentOS stream. You figure out what versions we actually did and what we're actually shipping. This is not really a via, I mean, e essentially this is what people are having to do right now is try and figure out the exact versions uh, that are being shipped. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's essentially make work. And <sighs> look, <laughs> It doesn't matter how hard Red Hat tries to make it for people to do this. People are going to do this. If they have to dig through CentOS stream releases, figure out exactly what matches the, the rel bits, they're going to do that. Never, never underestimate the, the tenacity of a bored program, or at least one who's got a, <laughs> who has a deadline they have to get to, and they're, they're just going to do this. But ben, um, is, this what, is this what Alma's going to do? Like, what is your approach to out. solving this? So, to, to kind of answer the question, what are we going to do? I feel like the answer is we're just going to build Enterprise Linux. Like we're, we're, Red Hat has done a great job of establishing a, a fantastic, uh, we'll say, target for all of us. But they don't own the rights to Enterprise Linux. We can make this happen without forcing uh, a forcing an uncomfortable conversation with Red Hat, right? We can, we can get around this. We're still going to build enterprise Linux without violating or even having to fight with Red Hat. That's how I feel about it. That's what Alma's doing. We're just going to build it. So um, go ahead and make your, but while you're making your comment, uh, if we can get the audience, if you have questions, raise your hand. There's a mic that'll be coming around to you. Go ahead. You were going to say something, Jim? Oh, no, I, was just, I, I, I was just clapping for Benny. Okay. <laughs> So, Hi, so there's actually a historical precedent here. Uh, I don't know whether anyone is old enough to remember. Was it United Linux in the? Yeah. Early <laughs> oh, I remember classes? United Linux. Yeah, uh, and that was a, that was an early goal to us. Hey, we're going to do a, a new, you know, we're going to compete with Red Hat. We're going to have an enterprise Linux called United Linux. They made the mistake of inviting Caldera, who became Sco, into the mix, which was unfortunately how that thing ended. Um, but what, one comment. Red Hat owns the rights to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That's their trademark. Yep. Um, but, and, and you have to give them credit for, for the brand and everything that's done around that. That's a superb marketing job. It's a superb you know, uh, job of building a business around that. But customers want freedom. And this is, um, I, rem I remind you of that Star Wars quote that, that it's just so apt. The more you grab, try and grab, the more things slip through your fingers. Uh, the, more, the more somebody tries to exert control over a code base, the more the pushback will occur from the people who collaborate in that code base. That's so, a great analogy, sand. Uh, yeah. Grab a handful of sand. I, I, Jeremy, my, my blog post on this had that quote in the first oh. draft, and Karen made me take it out. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Bradley. <laughs> so now that's, you get credit for it. That's management. Um, that's we have management a, qu a question. I see who it is, but I won't identify them in case they want to remain semi-anonymous. Uh, but go I, ahead. I'm, I'm Matt Wilson. I, I go by MSW on Twitter and other social media platforms. Um, you, you have an open question about if this business model over your study of 20 years is or is not compliant with the GPL. I'm curious about a different policy question, and that is, is it a GPL violation to void a warranty if someone modifies software? I, I think that's a lawyer question. 
Uh, yeah, and I'm not a lawyer, and I can't give legal advice. Uh, and Jim won't give you legal advice because he only gives it to Oracle. So I'm not sure we can answer the question for we you. Could, but uh, but I am not aware, and we to can... keep us on topic, I am not aware of Red Hat offering a warranty as part of RHEL. Um, so I don't know if it's actually relevant to their business model. Does anybody know if they do they actually offer any warranties to their customers? Go, go, go ahead, Matt, if you want to follow yeah, up. It's so, so like, it, from my mind, a warranty is a, pro, is a future promise to fix a defect in software, right? Or to fix a, a device, right? So it's, it's, it is providing a service in the future for you know, software that's not in your hand, right? So uh, today, the GPL fact says that uh, a, a warranty void uh, on modification of software, which is you know, a freedom that you have with free software. You have the freedom to modify the software, but if you modify it, maybe your war your warranty gets voided. So it's a service agreement for future, you know, performance of services that's voided by an exercising of software freedom. I don't think, so I'm, 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 I don't think I can opine on, on the GPL question, but I will say this, that just sort of, you know, sort of, extrapolating from other product areas, right? Like that have both things that implicate software and things that don't implicate software, right? Generally speaking, it's widely accepted in industry that if somebody modifies something, right, the vendor can escape warranty coverage within certain bounds, right? Like the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act Right, that like if you make, you know, if you put different tires on your car and the power windows fail, good luck to the OEM arguing that the change of tires affected the window motor. But, um, and, and you, you might analogize that to, to software as well. Um, fr frankly, I've, I've, I've never even thought about this question. Yeah, let, let's cue the next question. And the audience and Benny had something that you wanted to add, I think. Yeah, just being kind of nitpicky, I don't think. Red Hat is saying that you can't modify. They're just saying you can't modify and reship. Um, okay, that's fair, yeah. Well, they're saying you've breached their agreement. Yeah. That's a See, this is thing this is why I'm saying it's a different thing question. than saying you can't have service. Yo, do you have a mic there? Great. Um, hi, I'm Vagrant Cascadian and uh, I'm wondering, for the uh, historically downstream of Red Hat distributions, if you might consider adding some features that, uh, that uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux doesn't do, such as uh, high security gates through reproducible builds or something like that. 100%, yeah. One of the things that, that we're kind of excited about is the opportunities that this opens for us, right? We had decided we were just gonna focus on this North Star of one-to-one -one Red Hat no matter what. And with that limitation being removed, we have all kinds of options, right? So, uh, yeah, sure. One, one of the things that I've been working on in the past few months is FIPS certification. If you don't know what that is, you're very lucky. Uh, <laughs> if you do know what it is, my, my commiserations. We're working on FIPS certification for an earlier version of Rocky that Red Hat, I don't believe, FIPS certify. And we're planning to release that. We, we got the uh, go-ahead to release that as open source. Um, so all the changes for FIPS certification for Rocky will be um, published. Um, oh, thank you. I, I, I mean, it's, it's an awesome thing. Yeah, obviously it won't be upstream because Red Hat's not going to take that back, but it will, it will be available. Um, for people who want to do FIP certification, God help you. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the OpenSSL folks have have now released an open FIPS module, so that's kind of kind of huge. <laughs> sure, um, but not, yeah, not think, for this version. We, we're, we've backported that to an earlier version. So that is no, for, let's not get too off topic. The next one I think is here, and then we're going over here. Uh, hi, my name is Robert Wright. Um, I'm a newer contributor to Fedora, and I guess my question is a little bit. Welcome. Now. Thank you. <laughs> Um, obviously, Fedora has a really strong relationship with, you know, CentOS, and then thusly downstream to RHEL. Uh, for each of your enterprise Linuxes, are you all planning to expand uh, upstream and, you know, provide more contributions in that space? I guess I've not really seen it. Again, as a new contributor, I've been, you know, kind of I'm trying to understand, but yeah. uh, I guess I'm just kind of curious what plans are. I feel like I start everyone, but I don't. Ha I don't have to. Uh, <laughs> Do it. Well, okay. Okay. I, 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 I think um, so we're hiring a ton, right? Um, 
we're 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 going to be hiring a lot to be effectively to to have our own uh, compatible distribution. Now, you know, as to what's upstream, obviously, you know, we upstream the vast majority of our work to the kernel tree, right? So, uh, and, and frankly, I'm not sure that that Red Hat would even want our upstreams, and it would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> to manage under the circumstances. And if Jim and Oracle does hire, hire you, tell him you won't go to work for him unless you, he lets you keep your own copyrights on your contributions <laughs> to open source. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead Ben. Yeah, I, I get to keep my copyrights, so just pointing that out. Um, yeah, um, sorry, Jim. Uh, I live, Tough but fair. I live upstream. Um, so, yeah, I mean, whether you know it or not, you probably don't work in the area that I'm in, but my the stuff I write is built upstream and Red Hat is downstream from me. So yeah, you will. And, and you know, as, as CIQ grows and as more contributors, then yes, um, more work is gonna go on upstream as the business grows, so. As, as the one that doesn't have a company, we are already involved in Fedora, right? The, the, the community that is around Alma Linux is a bunch of people who have been involved in the entire ecosystem for a very long time. So it's not, there's no like question of whether or not we're gonna continue or expand or like whoever joins Alma Linux contributes wherever they want to, whenever they want to. And we certainly continue to encourage people to, to contribute upstream, for sure. Hi, um, so I'm, my name's Karsten Wade. And I'm not up on the panel, so I'm gonna work on making sure I don't make any comment, but I get to your question. <laughs> but I think it's worth setting context. Uh, I no longer work for Red Hat, but I was the architect who was responsible for bringing the CentOS team on board to Red Hat and all of that deal, okay. and then engineering manager and was on the board for a while. So uh, Red Hat liaison, other junk. So the, here's, the, here's the question. Um, you, talk, you all talked about various versions of digging around in source in a very um, disparaging manner. And I've also found it to, it, it's, it strikes me that it's possibly disingenuous. And so I'm asking you to, 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 in a very, like not to get into the technical weeds, but to really consider this, right? I'm familiar with the rebuild process of what CentOS has gone through. Yeah. CentOS has always been a clean room rebuild without knowing what was in the build tree around it. So the, and so when they do the rebuild, they just run a rebuild and then whatever doesn't work, you go back and manually figure out and start making guesses based off of Fedora. So it's always been, steps removed, right? <coughs> Excuse me. It's everyone else has insisted that CentOS and RHEL were the same thing. And so finally, people just said, well, it's the same thing or it's good enough, right? So what we're looking at now is the source is there. It's, it's a couple of steps removed. It's not in a source RPM. Now, whether a source RPM is a GPL required artifact or not, I don't know, right? But the source it, is still it is. there. But the, well, okay, now the conversation. I, I, I'll argue so it the, is. So my question for you is, isn't all of this thunder doing Red Hat's job for them of trying to get everyone to say, this thing is not the equivalent to RHEL, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. But I, I would like to kind of say, like, we, we're not afraid of digging around in source code, right? That's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. It, it, it's mate work. <laughs> it's, like, it's like when Red Hat uh, stopped you know, publishing the kernel patches, uh, it, it's, it's make work. I mean, people will figure it out, people, it, it, why do it? You know, oh yes, we're going to make your life more difficult. Thank you, congratulations, you've wasted a bunch of people's time. Great, um, okay, now can we get on with, with contributing and, and working together? To, to go not too far, but <laughs> one step into the weeds, half a step into the weeds, saying that some piece of code was extracted from one thing and put into another thing. And that that other thing that you put it into, all the sources available, I think it is, is a, a logically specious conclusion, right? When you backport something from one package to another, that does not mean that the thing that you backported it to has all the code a lot of times modifications are made in backporting. So the argument that the code is all out there, I think is just factually incorrect. It's, it's always been that case though, Jim, that's the point. The, the, my, my, my point is that if, if, if the goal of Red Hat is to say, your thing is not the same as RHEL, 
right? You've been, you're, and, and then, then you're proving the point, right? That you're, by going out and making all that noise and saying, now you've made it so much harder and so different, it's our thing can't be the same as well. Impossible. It never ever was. The sources, are, the, build system, the, the sources around from the build system and all the packages in the build system were never available. CentOS was always doing a clean room rebuild from source RPMs of their own, and then they'd build those from Distgate. I mean, it's, it's been this long. So yes, it's true. It's like the patches. It's making it, it's make work. It's making it more difficult. But the rest, so aside from it being more difficult, all of this question, are you not doing Red Hat's job for them by making so much thunder and noise about how this is so different and such a big break of trust and such a big thing, and instead of just saying, oh, well, the source is over here now, thanks, we'll just build from there. Yeah. Have a nice so, day. So I, I, have two, I have two responses to, to Karsten's point. The, the, first, the first is, the, and I told Karsten this back when he was dealing with bringing CentOS into Red Hat, that, that my big concern with CentOS being integrated into Red Hat was coming from the perspective of somebody who's spent most of their career enforcing the GPL. The reason I, for a good 12 year period, didn't worry about whether RHEL was complying with the GPL or not, was because CentOS, as an independent project, was getting something that all the CentOS developers telling me was relatively easily constructed, with some work, as you point out, Karsten, and was a match for a rebuild of Red Hat from the sources uh, that were released due to GPL requirements on Red Hat. So that watchdog aspect of CentOS was what was most interesting to me, because I'm, I'm not a CentOS or a RHEL user, or an Alma user, or a Rocky user, sorry to say. Certainly not an Oracle, like Oracle Linux user. No offense. Uh, I'm, I'm in Debian. But, 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 but I want to be sure that folks living in the RHEL, CentOS, you know, enterprise Linux space are getting the things they're right to get under GPL. And CentOS was that watchdog. Now I have two other watchdogs to talk to, Alma and Rocky. Um, I'm not counting you, Jim, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, but, and, and they're telling me, hey, it's hard right now for us. And then I get worried as a GPL enforcer. I'm like, wait, if the people who are trying to exercise the rights under GPL is say, are telling me it's hard right now to exercise our rights, I get worried as an enforcer. Then I look at another aspect of it, which is kind of what Jim was getting to with his quoting from Red Hat's statement about open source, which is, I always had viewed Red Hat as a company that wanted to be a top tier open source company. And from my point of view, if you just barely make it into being compliant with the GPL, I give you a C. It's a passing grade, but when I was in school at least, I think most people in this room when they were in school, they really worked hard to get the A, not the C. And I'm very, very sad to see that Red Hat wants no more A's in GPL compliance. They're gonna settle for straight C's. The best kind of correct is technically correct. <laughs> and, and, and to be honest, none of us here are the arbiters of whether it's good enough of a rebuild of Red Hat Linux. The customers are the arbiters of, is this good enough for our purposes? Yeah, we're and, all... And, sorry, just let me... Yeah, the, yeah, then yeah. customers who, who really need absolute and complete fidelity by Red Hat. That's what I would say. Go out there, give them money, get the real thing. You know, if, 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 you can, if you can live with something that's close, then there are alternatives. Oh, oh, ben, Benny first. Oh, Dan, did you have something you want to add here? No, go for it. Uh, well, I, I was, so th 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 this is sort of an, an important point that like, people ask what we, sort of why we're doing this, right? And, and the answer is because customers require it in, in, in substantial part by virtue of other projects that target compatibility, right? They, they only wanna build and test on a single system. Some of them are open source, some of them are proprietary products that the customers are using, right? And so w w why do it? The reason is that the, 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 the customers, and it doesn't have to be paying customers, end users require it, right? That's, you know, so. Let's, let's jump to this question. I'll give you first on this one, Penny. Okay. Yeah, my name is Eric Benner, and I'm a, I guess, technology guy here. Um, did I do that? Further, further, away, further away from your mask. Further away? Okay. Yeah. Um, so to me, the whole thing seems to be that in the past, and I've, I use Red Hat, sold Red Hat over the years. They've been like the, the standard for enterprise Linux, and it seems that with Red Hat moving, and I'll say a closed source model, by their own definition, it's a closed source model. If you go to their website, they say one of the definitions of closed source is you can't redistribute the software and they're telling people you can't redistribute. To me, they're the number one closed source Linux distribution. 
But with that in mind, they used to be the golden standard of making an enterprise Linux and making it where the community could have a standard to go to. And it seems like they've moved away from that. And all this discussion and all this argument is about is a community we're trying to map to an enterprise standard that the industry can agree to. And this allows third-party companies, not just open source, but commercial companies like Oracle, like Splunk, like you know, hundreds of other companies to have a standard of how they're going to write to know their product's going to be supported. And with, Inter with Red Hat moving away from that and pushing the community away, what are the odds of the three of you all, Rocky and Alma and Oracle, getting together and actually building an enterprise Linux standard and saying this is the new golden standard that the well, community Well, Susie too, follow. don't forget. Don't forget Susie as well. And they, Susie, they, yeah, they, but I mean, it's regardless of who, the three of you are up there now. But, then but what would be the opportunity of everyone getting together and saying we're going to make an open standard for what enterprise Linux means and these distributions follow it and if you're an ISV, if you're building software, you're building applications, follow this standard. I think to, to answer the direct question, chances are real high, right? This is a very new thing. It's, we're, what, three weeks into it? So I think everyone sees that as the obvious answer. I think that's the, the obvious next step. I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, 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 and right, I, I think everybody on the stage here, all of our Linux distributions are open and free, mm -hmm. right? And, right, and, and, and these folks are, are, are public benefit corporations. We're not, we're for profit, but we've made a, a, a public pledge that we're gonna keep, the Oracle Linux has, has been free to download the whole time for, for many, many years, but we've pledged to, to continue that. All of the source will be available to the extent that the market evolves, answering your question, to the extent that the market asks us to standardize, you know, we're all responsive. Remember, enterprise Linux is what the customers say it is. And so, if the customers say something that's close to Red Hat but not exactly Red Hat is, is good enough, then that's what we will be. If the customers say, no, it has to be a, a rebuild bug for bug compatible, then that's what we're gonna try and be. We're going to try and meet the market needs. We're gonna try and do what the users require because, I mean, that's the whole point of this thing is to produce freedom for the people using, developing, creating, using the software. Well the said. maximum amount of freedom. Okay, we're going to let Matt ask another question, but if you haven't asked a question yet, please get your hand up and get a mic from Tom here. This is a question for Jim. Uh, in the spirit of harmonizing uh, different licenses and agreements, uh, would w Oracle be willing to relicense CFS under the GPL? <laughs> yeah, why not, sure. Jim? Let's have that conversation. <laughs> good times, good times. You've woken my dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ZFS is apparently a command for his dog, as the, it turns out. The bombshell question, the bombshell question wakes the dog up. Um, I'm not going to answer that here. It, it's a, yes, I know. It's a good boy. Uh, it's, not, it's not the first time I've been asked. Good boy, down. And, and we'll, we'll all remind Jim that he can solve so many of the world's problems with a stroke of a pen, just publish a new CDDL but, but, that's compatible with the but, but in, in, in fair, But in fairness, um, you know, there's already, you know, if memory serves, the canonical folks were making a, a, a ZFS kernel module, right? Which we, is in violation but of the GPL. However, and your license too. Well, but, but well, but uh, so so, we you and I had a different opinion on that, which I, th I think I've told you before, um, and right. So so I guess my take on this is put, putting that question entirely aside. You can already run. ZFS, right? The right, no, no one. Right, uh, speaking as a copyright holder in the kernel and in ZFS itself, as, we're not complaining if you do that. As, so, as an end user, you have the freedoms necessary to do it. So, right. Oh, sorry, yeah. I can't hear you. Uh, well, I, because I was interested in this topic, I, I let. It's really not on topic for the panel, despite my love for this topic <laughs> in ZFS. Yeah. Do you really want to say not something on it? Time we've talked about this. <laughs> I just have one comment. I, I do have some sympathy for you, Jim, because I was at S, SGI when we open sourced XFS, <laughs> and the reason, I mean, at least one of the reasons that I recommended, hey, because they were saying, what license should we use? And one of the reasons I recommended the GPL is, Sun can't use it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, well, but so we first throw here, the please, please, please ask us people the topic question. License is a commercial weapon is, 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 has an old history. But, but we're not even doing that. Uh, okay, one topic question from the front row. Here we go. Yeah, well, I hope it's on topic at least. Uh, I'll do my best. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I feel like historically one of the benefits of using either our hell or something like the historical centers, which was, you know, truly bug for bug compatible, was that um, you got a flow for supports from ISVs who have a pre-existing agreement with Red Hat because then you could use that stuff. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about those relationships that Red Hat and our hell had historically with ISVs and how you're kind of thinking about that. Hopefully that's on topic. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely on topic. The the answer is we're already in conversations with them anyway, because a number of the ISVs wouldn't officially support non-Red Hat distributions, right? They'd say, well, it should probably work, or they'll, you know, whatever whatever backward way that they wanted to say it would support, eh, we might get there. So that's not really a new problem for us, because it's the ex existing problem, right? Is getting them to admit that it still works. <laughs> in this case, it's going to be opening up and expanding testing, right? Finding ways to reduce the barrier for those ISVs to add official support for us is like maybe more cumbersome now, but it's the, it's the same problem that we've had. And and, and you know, I, being being a, 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 as part of a small company, if something doesn't work. It doesn't matter whether it did work on Red Hat or didn't work on Red Hat, it's always our fault. Yep. <laughs> As a, the smallest vendor or the smallest provider in the ecosystem, the customers always say it's your fault because they're the one they can, they know that they can whip the hardest. <laughs> oh, oh, they push, do that to us too. Push them. <laughs> Well, yeah, but you can push back. <laughs> and, and from my point of view, as a, as a software freedom zealot, this this is the place where I have the most trepidation about this whole issue, right? Because the the the, the unstated assumption here, uh, which I think is is correct, and, and and my colleague Denver, who's in the audience, was the first to point this out to me, so I should give him credit for this. That in the end, the compatibility question is not an open source question; it's a proprietary software question because you can always recompile the open source stuff to make sure that it, that it works works, generally speaking, um, or fix it if you need to. But if you have a binary that's proprietary, that's when you need that perfect binary compatibility with RHEL. And in, in, a, lo in a lot of cases, the value add, uh, or, or part of the value, not a value add, but the value that these distributions are offering is that binary compatibility. And my sympathy for people who really want compatibility so they can do proprietary software it is admittedly quite limited. I, I have more sympathy. Um, <laughs> Why am I not surprised? For, sure, for, for obvious reasons, but also, but also, I think have you know to the, to the ex, you know there there is a uh, it, there's less work for people who are building even binary releases of open source Agreed. to target less platforms. So it's um, we have one back there, and then there's going to be one up front. Hi, uh, Mike Jang. I'm a, the author of the Red Hat Certified Engineer Study Guide, which is copyrighted. Uh, <laughs> Acceptable. I, I, I'm not n not speaking loud enough, or I, I wasn't sure what your signal was. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Ubuntu, canonical. I, I haven't heard that name mentioned. I, I see Oracle swooping in and trying to uh, appeal to us as an open source community, but w w what about them? I mean, what? what I'm surprised they aren't here. Uh, maybe you appeal to them. Uh, what, what's going on with that? I think r realistically the only way that they're strongly impacted is by the people that are joining their community, that are migrating to them, right? I would have loved to have them here to have a, a different perspective because we're all very embedded, right? But I don't, I don't know that... Yeah, and to be clear, we, we didn't invite Mr. Shuttleworth, and we thought that if his, cano if his canonical one aircraft landed at PDX, it would have made news and maybe gotten a lot more <laughs> attendees. But as far as I know, canonical one did not land uh, at PDX, so he is not here. 
I, 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 they, admittedly, when we put this panel together, Canonical wasn't at the top of the list, mainly because it is not their goal, as far as I know, to be binary compatible with RHEL. Their goal is to disrupt RHEL from the marketplace, um, and I would kind of guess that, that I'm putting words in the Mark's mouth, but I'm sure he finds this somewhat amusing, what's happening over here, because I would expect that disruption in the, the RHEL-related space, uh, it, it admittedly has the side effect of being good for Canonical's business. It, good for Debian too, which is a great open source project who I wholeheartedly support. So. Uh, by the way, actually maybe the case, I can't remember if anybody knows, Shuttleworth's plane is called Canonical One or Ubuntu One. It's one or the other is the name of his plane, but I don't remember what it is. So Bradley, did you invite someone from Debian as well? Or? Um, we, we had trouble finding somebody that could speak. It's always finding somebody who has, a, has an authority to speak on behalf of Debian. So we did not solve that problem, unfortunately. <laughs> Go ahead, Singh Palina. Yeah, I was just thinking about the, the discussion about binary compatibility being primarily interesting for <clears throat> running uh, proprietary applications and uh, so I wanted to ask uh, Jim what you think uh, uh, about, as the representative of a producer of proprietary applications that do run on these systems, uh, making sure that Oracle's proprietary applications are certified to run on Alma and Rocky. That's a good question. I know no one's asked before this moment. Um, given that we are all targeting similar things. I, I, I guess it's a little early to call. It's a little early to call. And frankly, um, identically between open source and proprietary systems, right, there, there's a burden of testing, right, and, and support on all the systems, right? So you could question, like, well, why don't you support? There, there are many other Linux distributions Right, that we could also certify on, and frankly, I think that's going to be premised on customer demand, right? And it's not even necessarily going to be the same from application to application, right? Because customers running, you know, the stuff that's produced by our communications business units, right? That like the the telcos, right? They have different platform requirements than the people who are running the hospitality stuff or right so, so um i don't think you could really address that question broadly but rather it's going to be very application granular i've got some testing space oh it's uh, but it, you got you got it's the it's the manpower really it's, oh i it's know not the, yeah, it's not the hard oh i know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a big fan of community driven things and i would like to uh contrast this with the way that wine works so Wine has the target of binary compatibility with a Windows system. And I, I know this is not enterprise software, it's not mission critical or whatever, but, but people run games on Wine and they have a reporting system that says, does this work, what standard is it, what breaks, et cetera. And you know, this, this is the customers and users self-organizing to achieve a goal. And Wine gets better because of the, those reports. And Alma, Rocky, Oracle will all get better if people try proprietary software or, 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 or free software in binaries on them and report what doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and so this is a, a, a massive value to the community. And if you want this, I suggest you help self-organize something. Because right. Wine did it, and they work great. Right. I, well, I do most of my gaming with Windows binaries on Wine. Well, my concern about the self-organizing for this kind of reporting, like, make sure that it's uh, truly anonymous, because I would worry Red Hat would troll that for people uh, to do their audits against, because they might find, oh, wait, our customer is off trying Rocky. Maybe, maybe they aren't Bradley, paying for as many real licenses. They're not the bad guys. They're uh, not the bad guys. They're just trying to make money. Well, but... And Bradley, yeah, so, so, that is bad guys. But, but Bradley's situation... <laughs> My situation. What, 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 the, uh, situation Bradley, Bra I, I want to say Bradley's hypothetical doesn't. I, I wouldn't imagine that that can't happen. Yeah, I, right? and like I, when I, you say they're not the bad guys, really? they. Uh, and, and it's it's not like it's not like there are plenty of people at Red Hat who are not the bad guys, but they 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 have salespeople. They have salespeople who are aggressive. We had an example which I put in my blog post where Red, we heard a report 
from a very large company that said Red Hat was demanding royalty fees. And I saw the email discussion with Red Hat salespeople saying, you owe us the word royalty for putting these pieces of RHEL into your product. Now, this company pushed back because they were no fools, and they said, no, we don't know your royalty. It's under the GPL. OK, and that's but, the bad guy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> well, and, 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 and we have that report right, right. that happened. It's a resolved situation. But the fact that that sometimes happened inside, inside Red Hat, probably not the typical, is a problem. And, and, and to be clear, right, the fact that there are no, like I have friends at Red Hat for many years as well, right, um, the fact that there are no doubt, I know for a fact, many good people, well-intentioned people working at Red Hat does not mean that what they are doing now is consistent with open source by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, it, it sucks, but it, it is a business, and that business is made up of individuals. So there's going to be, like, how many people does Red Hat employ? <laughs> I, get, I guess I'm blessed that I mostly deal with engineers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we are, um, we are usually of a sunny disposition until it concerns yeah. things in the software. If you, if you ask them if, if, if they were making these decisions, I'm not sure they would have decided and, things and the same way. Yes, I, I agree with that. And, and perhaps we should end uh, on that statement that we, most everybody in the room loves engineers who work for Red Hat, and I think that's probably true. Maybe not Jim, but everybody else. No, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I just said I have a lot of friends at Red Hat. Yeah, yeah. I do. I'm trying to hire them. Um, so we, we have to Yeah, yeah and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to hire I'll them. give everybody the last 10 seconds. Benny, go. Come hang out. We're doing awesome stuff. I'm blown away by the support and excitement that we've seen, and uh, it's going to be a good time. So uh, one of the funniest comments I saw uh, was on LinkedIn, actually, uh, where someone referred to RHEL as the official OS of stepping on a rake. And I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think, unfortunately, this is, this is really what... Because they brought a great deal of interest and uh, excitement about the Red Hat alternatives by doing this. So thank you. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. If you want to work on open source Linux, we are hiring. <laughs> uh, and I will end if, as you're walking around the free software community and you do something you think the GPL should allow you to do, but you ended up stepping on a rake, please email compliance at sfconservancy.org. Thank you for doing everything you do. Thanks a lot. I want to ask for another round of applause for our panelists. A lot of them came, a last minute travel to all be here with you. Please give them a big round of applause. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. The, the tracks the rest of the day are downstairs. Feel free to use this room to chat and hang out. <laughs>